Welcome to episode 21 of Real Life, Real Gospel, sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. I'm your host, Josh, Vicar Josh Laborious, and every week we release a new episode where we try to approach a common problem or situation or question that comes up when we're talking about real life and Christianity and our faith and the scriptures. So every week I take that topic submitted by a listener, submitted by one of you, and I do my best to approach the topic, to talk about the topic and kind of dissect it in a way that is accessible and in a way that keeps very well grounded the reality of living as a Christian. In my pursuit of this, I do things like trying not to use really heavy theological or academic or philosophical language. So if you're looking for that or if I'm describing something and you're thinking, well, there's a philosophical word or a theological word for that, I'm probably avoiding it, mostly intentionally. If I do occasionally use any of those words, I do my best to define them for you. And if I use them, it's because I find them much more helpful than any, I guess, alternative way of describing what I'm talking about. So that's kind of what this show is. And this week, we're going to kind of just talk about the question of why. And fundamentally, I think two branches of this question is, is what comes up in our discussion today, and that's why bother living and why bother trying to live in accordance with God's will? Why why try to live like we should, I guess? So the core question is why bother? And this topic is courtesy of, uh, of a buddy of mine via Facebook. And the original question, to be fair, wasn't this general, it was a little more specific. It was, why bother living if Jesus is coming back anyway? Which is a pretty narrow question, and and I hope to address it, but I I wanted to get a little broader because I think the reality is that we, we struggle with this question of why bother on a little bit more of a broad scale than just that. So my intention is to approach that question to try and address and hopefully tackle that question at least a little bit. I will be the first to admit it's a difficult topic. It can be hard to kind of put together, kind of very hard to answer. So we're going to we're going to attempt it. If you have a topic that you want to hear me address in the coming weeks, feel free to submit as a comment on YouTube or Spotify or I don't think Spotify actually has comments so I guess you can't do that but on any of the platforms you would listen on you could comment alternatively you can send me a message uh, on Facebook you can send me an email whatever floats your boat so as we step into this topic I like I said I want to broaden it to why bother doing what we do. Why bother living? Why bother following the law? Why bother with anything? So maybe a little tongue in cheek here, but this is episode 21, Real Futility, Real Gospel. And our first text that we're going to dive into today, our first biblical text that addresses this, comes from Ecclesiastes. And if you've been in the church for a a while, you might have heard this one before. My suspicion is maybe never preached on, but Ecclesiastes 1 says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanities of vanities, says the preacher, vanities, uh, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north, around and around goes the wind. And on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. 
The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new? It has already been done in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. So, a little bit of poetic language, a lot of bit of poetic language there, and I want to start by giving a little bit of context for this. So this text, this book of scripture, is written by Solomon, uh, king of Israel, son of David, who had everything. He was he was blessed by God with wisdom and that and riches and health and power, and he presided over a golden age of Israel. He had anything under the sun that he could possibly want, and. As a result, he has kind of a unique freedom to explore any and all potential source of meaning or motivation. There is nothing outside of his reach. So, you may ask, well, that's not my life. How does this connect to us? Well, before I get to that, I want to walk through this passage a little bit more. So, when it it opens up and it says, what does a man gain by all the, all the work that he does, essentially? It says, the generation goes, the generation comes, but the earth remains forever. So, what it's getting at there is, kind of no matter what you work for, the next generation that comes is, has all the full potential to waste it. It says, the sun just goes up and comes down and goes up and go- comes down. The wind comes and goes, all in a circuit. The streams go to the sea, and then the sea goes to the streams, and back and forth, and back and forth. We're never full. There's nothing new under the sun. So, I think there's this reality that our society, our culture, our our existence reflects this. What can we do with our work? Nothing. We can't earn our salvation. We can't save our own lives. We can't control much. It, it's something that I kind of joke about a lot. If you've ever, I guess, watched the news or talked about common events, whether that's in the church or outside of the church, frequently I'll say, well, here's how we should do it. For example, if you watch the news, you'll see how various lawmakers are trying to respond to the coronavirus or to handling the economy. And I was having a conversation with my wife the other day about what I think they should be doing in response to everything that's going on and and the economy and the state it's in. But whenever I make comments like that where I say, this is what we should do, or about, say, our church body, and I say, well, this is really how we should run things. I close my comments with something along the lines of, but nobody asked me. Because there's this reality that so much in our lives is completely outside of our control. And that's even if you're not thinking with a heavenly eternal perspective. That's just how much of our lives is dictated by institutions and organizations and governments and people who we've never met making decisions that impact us. So we have this lack of control, and if you broaden that up to God, that's even crazier because there's this reality that even things we think we can control, we can't. If he wants it to go the other way, it's going to go the other way. And Solomon, in, in this text from Ecclesiastes, is experiencing that on a profound level and speaking to that. So the response here, and this is kind of dark. This leaves us in kind of a dark, helpless place. But later in Ecclesiastes, I think Solomon speaks to that dark place it puts us in. He says, I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful. And to do good as long as they live. 
Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been. That which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been dri driven away. So there's this reality that God is in control. And our joy is in the gifts that he gives us. In the, the things in our lives that he has given us. The, the pleasures. The work that he gives us. The eat, the food and the drink and, and everything else. And his law. To be joyful and do good as long as they live. That's, that's kind of this thing that Solomon's driving at. So there is a joy in living as God has intended us to. Which starts our conversation answering the question, why bother? With, with this attitude of futility, why bother? That's kind of why I start here. Because there's, there's a reality that scripture grapples with this issue head on. With this feeling of futility. It grapples with It's not an ignored issue. It's not a hidden issue. And there's this reality that it's a struggle for all of mankind. Not just now, but thousands of years ago. Not just for regular people, but for kings. For one of the most powerful kings in history. And there's a reality that this is what happens when you look outside of God for fulfillment. When you try and fulfill yourself or give yourself purpose or find your own meaning. So one of the other reasons I did this is it kind of levels the playing field. Because no one has more wisdom or more power or more riches that is listening to this podcast that could listen to this podcast than Solomon did. So there's this reality that none of us are excluded from this issue. But there's a gospel, and this, this comes from that second part of Ecclesiastes I read, that God gives us incredible gifts. And there's a reality that our lives, there's a joy, there's a gospel in that our lives are not futile. It's just not our plan. So when we look at things we do or things that are going on and we say, well, this doesn't matter. Why bother? We may not see the bigger picture. We may not see what's going on. We may not see the purpose, but God does. So with that, I want to drive us forward into the gospel. And it's gospel that I'm sure many of you have heard before. It comes from Matthew 5, where Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Again, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So, the textual background notes I have for this one are, it is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And this pretty directly gets at our purpose for living, and the purpose behind following the law. So, I want to approach this first part first, this idea of be salt. Which sounds ridiculous and if you are in tune with certain elements of pop culture saltiness is maybe not something a christian should strive for but what he's speaking to here is an older reality for salt so practically speaking what is salt literal salt used for it's a preservative and it's a it's a flavor it's a spice at the time it was a valuable spice so there's this reality that if we're being called to be salt, the, the functionality of that is we are called to preserve God's creation and God's will and God's law. We're given our purpose right there. We are to preserve the world and, and to give flavor to the world. 
to show God's glory to the world. Which is then continued in this conversation of being light. Which, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works. That is our light. And give glory to the Father. So you ask, why bother? What is what is the purpose of living? What is the purpose of following God's law? It's to give God glory. It's all for God's glory. So why do we do anything? We live to the glory of God. We live to the glory of God as a witness to others. We do works. We do good things. We follow God's law to the glory of God. To witness that glory to others. And in reality, no no matter what your question of futility might be, no matter why you may ask, why bother? That drives everything. We we bother because we're, we're trying to glorify God. We're living for Him. We are living sacrifices for Him. So what does that look like? Well, that looks like vocation, which is a word that I've used before on this podcast. It is a theological word that I use very intentionally. It's a theological word that talks about all of the different positions that God has put us in, uh, callings that God has put us in, that we have a task to fulfill on his behalf. So this includes, yes, your job or your career, but this also includes your position as son or daughter, as, as sister or brother, as mother, father, husband, wife, friend, community member, voter. All of these are different vocations. And that's one of the things that it looks like. It looks like doing our best to live faithfully in those vocations. And in addition to that, it looks like living differently. And there's a little bit of challenge with this because it's a call to be the same person on Thursday that you are on Sunday. If I see you Sunday morning for worship, and obviously not right now because we're still in stay home, but if I were to see you on a Sunday morning and you are excited, you're talking about the gospel with the people around you, you're giving hugs, you're supporting the people around you who are struggling, you're worshiping God with everything you've got, we have that, and then Thursday, you don't say a word about God. There's no joy in how you're living your life. You're not supporting the people around you where you work or where you go to school. And that's not what you're called to do. You're called to be the same person in both places. And that may manifest slightly differently, but you're called to be the same person. And, and that's maybe a challenge I have for some of you guys. So there's this reality that we are called to be completely devoted to God because everything we do and are is his and it's for his glory. And that's the reality. And that can be a tough reality for some of us to accept, but it is what it is. I mean, that's what we're called to be. But the gospel here is that even that is a gift God has given us purpose and joy and and something to witness to. And it's what we're built for. So all of this, it's a joy. It's not a burden. So with that, I want to step into our last text for today. And that is Philippians 1. Starting at verse 18, going for a while, it says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know I will remain and continue with you all, for your progress and joy in the faith, 
so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus, because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict you saw I had, and now here I still have. So this is a text written to the church in Philippi by Paul, who is one of the uh, he, he wrote most of the New Testament, and he's, he's struggling with this futility, this reality of, if when I die I'm going to go be with Jesus, why bother living? Why bother remaining? And he answers it pretty quickly and pretty directly. It says, for the sake of those around us, to be Christ to those around us, to share the gospel to those around us. To give people a reason to glory and to celebrate in Jesus Christ. So what I want to break down a little bit is what does it mean to be Christ? If to live is Christ, to die is gain, there's this reality. What does it mean to live to be Christ? And the reality here is we live as he did. It's it's a sacrificial life for the sake of our neighbors to bring people closer to God, to bring people into relationship with God. And like I've been talking about, you can do that wherever you are in life, whatever career or school or whatever you are a part of. You can be this in your family, with your friends, with your colleagues and co-workers and peers, wherever. You can be Christ to them. Live in God's will and for his glory. It's, it's really as simple as that. So the reality is, that this is this can be a hard lesson and it can be it's difficult to accept to live but it's also an inescapable lesson but the gospel here is that we have a promise in Christ and that truly to die is gain so there's this reality of what's the worst that could happen the worst that could happen is that we end up with Jesus So in answer to the first question, why bother living if Christ is coming again so we can live to his glory and so we can bring other people closer to him? And in response to my further question, why do we bother living according to the law? Why bother doing anything? It's to God's glory and to bring other people closer to him. So hopefully if, if you're struggling with some feelings of, of futility, maybe that helps. I hope that helps. Because there's this, this reality, it is worth bothering. It is worth doing these things. So live as Christ. And, and that's, our, that's our message on, on real futility, real gospel. And again, I hope that was helpful to you. I realize that that is a tougher topic and maybe a little bit more of a a head topic than some of our other topics, which have been much more, I guess, hands-on kind of practical. If you have a topic that that came up as a result of this, a question maybe that that came up, please uh, reach out to me, ask me. I love to hear questions like that. You can reach out via email. My email is vicar at com. That's V-I-C-A-R, violet, indigo, color, ambient, ray shielded. I really need to work on my uh, alphanumeric, whatever. Anyway, so we have that. You can email me, vicar at com. Reach out to us on Facebook. We, we love to hear from you. We love to hear your topics and questions and comments and concerns. And if this is if this is your first episode, first of all, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. If it was helpful or if you think it could be helpful, especially with 
maybe some different issues, I'd encourage you, wherever you found this, whether it's on Spotify or Podbean or Google Podcasts, iTunes or YouTube, go back. All of our episodes are up. All 20 of the previous episodes, we cover everything from politics to, I guess, the reality of reading your Bible and and so many things in between and on either side of those things. So go for it. It is there for you and hopefully they can help you with whatever you're struggling with right now. So with that, this has been episode 21 of Real Life, Real Gospel. I'd encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe to our podcast, wherever you're listening to podcasts. Give us a like, and we'll see you again next week. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.